isn't it? I'm, I'm afraid you might not like what I have to say. But I'm only going to say it for 15 minutes, so after that, it doesn't really matter. You'll be fine. Um, oh, let's jump through that. So, managing leadership stress. What is it? Allegedly, the level of pressure which exceeds your perceived ability to coach. So, and this is a bit you won't like, it's got nothing to do with the external environment. It's got nothing to do with anybody else. It's only got to do with you and the way you perceive the environment. Two people, same event. One person sees it as a fantastic challenge. The other person sees it as a terrible threat. So it's the internal resources that change. And I don't really like this quote, but I was given this one, and this is a bit that's a bit rude, but I hope you'll understand. For me, stress is the brain's ability to override the body's basic desire to choke the living daylight out of somebody that really needs it. Have you ever been there? You know you're not allowed to, but you would like to. Yeah? When they don't put a little X on the end of their text, it's unacceptable. But that's really what it's about. So that's, I'm not going to talk about uh, how to stay fit and healthy as a uh, business person because it's really easy. Okay? It's, it really is. If you want to write this down, um, it's simple. I've worked it out. You first of all need to uh, eat less. You need to play a bit more. Uh, you need to sleep well and relax. Okay? True? And you all know that stuff. It's really, really simple. Let me test you out. If you eat more canapes than exercise, what happens to your weight? <laughs> See? You knew it. <clears throat> and what sort of food should you eat? Should you eat canopies and champagne and red wine and the chocolates and all those sort of things? We all know what we should do and what we shouldn't do. The issue is about the choices we make. So that's all I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about a little bit about the choices that we make. And I'm going to talk about your brain. I apologise to any neuropsychologists in the room because I'm going to simplify it and I'd like you to leave after the next 12 minutes with an understanding of just three elements of your brain and I'm going to make it a bit of fun. I'm not going to get too theoretical. Uh, there's lots more to it, but these three will do as a beginning. Would that be all right? Yep. Okay, so brain one. Brain one's really old, but it's really important. It's the bit that's kept you alive. It's the bit that's kept you, uh, uh, your mother, your father, your grandparents, your great-grandparents going. Your autonomic nervous system is made up of two elements. The sympathetic division, which is not sympathetic at all. The sympathetic is the bit that you've probably heard of, the fight-flight mechanism, the adrenaline, the stuff that gets you up. And just imagine if you didn't have this. Well, you'd be very comfortable and very relaxed. You wouldn't get much done. And frankly, you'd have been eaten by a dinosaur because you just said, dinosaur, you need to chill. Take it easy. But we didn't. We either got up or we ran away. Both of those activities are physiological. So this sympathetic adrenaline stuff First thing it does, it increases your heart rate. It increases your blood pressure. It also increases your level of cholesterol, not diet. Cholesterol is anxiety related. What else does it do? Well, it transfers your blood flow. Where do you want your blood if you think you're gonna to have to run or fight? Heart and muscles. There's two places you don't need it, one of which is in your gut. Now we have a special word for this, it's called pressure-induced evacuation. You all know it's a different colour and different smell. I was in Germany two weeks ago, and one of the participants, whose English was a bit broken, he said, Mr. Neil, I, I know what you are saying. You are saying such a shit yourself, yeah? <laughs> well, it's impolite, but yeah, that's exactly what happens. But it's really important because it's, it gets you going, it gets you up in the morning, and uh, makes sure you do stuff, which is great. But can you imagine a world where you're constantly sympathetically stimulated? You'll burn out. Excitement's great, but too much of it, and you'll wear out. So we have another part called the parasympathetic. And the parasympathetic, that lovely bit. Let me take you back. Who's got kids? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to parasympathetically stimulate you. I want you to imagine it's a Saturday evening. You've been out for a nice meal. Uh, you come back home. You fall asleep in your darling's arms. You wake up in the morning, and there's dappled light coming through the window. There are birds tweeting. You wake up slowly and gently. You go downstairs, you take some organic bread, spread organic marmalade on top of it, take it up with freshly brewed tea to your beloved, you eat it, you have a little cuddle, perhaps a bit more. You fall asleep, you read the papers, you go to the pub, you relax all afternoon, and you prepare for Monday morning. Do you remember that? <laughs> no, because you were sympathetically stimulated. Kids, family, things to do, things to go on with. You haven't got time to relax, but that's what parasympathy is. And when those two are balanced, will go really well. 
Now, fortunately, Simon is going to tell you a lot more about that, and, and this is the important bit, how you measure it. Because it's really hard to measure, because it's so deep. It's not conscious, it's not unconscious, it just does stuff. You can't control it. If you could, secrete some bile. <laughs> no? It's really hard. So what controls it? When your sympathetic and parasympathetic are in balance, when you're dealing with the fight flight, the adrenaline and the cortisol, when the two are in balance, you'll perform at a very high level, but you have no control over it. The bit that controls that is brain two. Now this is sort of conscious, but again, you've got no control over it. This is your filter on the world. What's that? A glass what? A half, a half full. Yeah, because you can condition to try and be positive. All right? <laughs> How many of you thought it's empty? It's half empty. Yeah? Secretly, you don't want to talk about it. Any engineers in the room? That's an inefficiently designed vessel for the fluid it's holding. It's ridiculous. What a, what a useless. Yeah. The point to make is brain two controls how you filter and see the world, your perceptions. Now, unfortunately, your perceptions are not based upon how you think, they're based upon how you're brought up. Some of which actually is in your DNA. Who loves their kids? Who would kill for their kids? Which I'm sure you're aware is against the law. <laughs> So what is it that drives you to do that? Did you like your kids after a year or nurtured them after six months, really getting into them, or did you just love them? See, there are certain things in this part of their brain that will actually make sure you would secrete adrenaline. Because if someone pushes my little boy over, I might have a little bit of adrenal secretion, would you? Yeah? I might just go, don't worry, he's a little bastard anyway. Don't worry. Yeah? So what controls it is this level two. And unfortunately, level two whoops, let's just go back one, is different for all of us. I'm just going to try and make this work. Try again. Oh. Oh, relax. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Oh, there we go. Now, here we go. We've got it. Right. Have a look at this lady. I apologise for her nakedness. Is she turning clockwise or anti-clockwise? Hands up if you've got to go in this way. Yes. yes. Look at these fools. Look, people with their hands down. These people think it's going that way. Who thinks it's going that way? Look at these people. Do, is there a third group, the real weirdos? <laughs> Have you got to do this? Yeah. Sorry, you're on charge, aren't you? Sorry about that. So there's the same image, nothing up my sleeves, but you're seeing it in three different ways. It's exactly the same. This is how brain two works. It does something horrible called thin slicing. It picks up a small amount of information and says, that's how the world is. And based on that, it's either a threat or a challenge. If it's a threat, I'm going to adrenalise you. If it's a challenge, you can handle it. Tell me, who in this room has a little voice inside their heads? Is it just me? Yeah? And sometimes when a situation arises, does that voice say, no problem, you can handle it, easy. And on other occasions, does it go, oh, what are you doing here? You shouldn't have got this job. If only they knew how inadequate and poor you were. Yeah? If that little voice says you can't handle it, you will adrenalise. If it says that you can handle it, you will adrenalise, but you'll be excited. So this brain too is really important, but it's not controlled by what people tell us. It's controlled by experiences. If you see a child eating in this manner, what do you think? In fact, if I ate like that, what would you think? Parents' fault. Pardon? Parents' fault. Why? What's wrong? You think there's nothing to So? <laughs> what's the problem? No, I'm serious though. What's the problem with this? I, do some of you find this offensive? Why? Why is this a problem? Because I was taught not to be your Oh yeah, but I'm sure you're taught lots of things. Doesn't mean it's right. Because if we went down that, we'd be trapped by something called cognitive bias. True story. A friend of mine uh, is a very well-known rugby player called Nigel Redmond. He went on the first ever tour to South Africa. And they went on a tour down into the high veldt of, uh, of South Africa with, uh, and playing the first ever game, England versus a South African team, which were all white and all Afrikaans. When one of our players was hit, a black player called Adadeo Adebayo was hit, and Polax, they all cheered. The man in front of Nigel Redman stood up and said, welcome to South Africa, welcome to apartheid it lives. Unfortunately, on either side of uh, Nigel Redmond was Victor Obugu and Paul Hull. They're both people of colour. Do you think they were adrenalised by this person's difference at level two? His perception of the world was different to these two. Yeah? Luckily, Nigel showed some control and said, don't say anything, there's a lot of them. 
10 minutes later, the exact reverse happened. Adedeo hit their superstar blonde haired, blue eyed beauty. Not only did he pick him up, but the rules were different, then he drove him back 10 yards, dumped him in the deck, and knocked him out. The crowd went absolutely silent, which was a shame because that was the moment at which Paul Hull decided to stand up and initiate brain one activity and shouted to the whole group, Taste the chocolate, my friends. <laughs> we all have different views. It's caused by what happens at our level two. We think and we feel, and this determines whether we adrenalize lives or whether we relax. And that's outside of our control. So let me tell you about the third part of the brain. The third part of the brain is a bit easy now. You're thinking and you're considering. And some of you are making decisions. Some of you are making cognitive decisions. Some of you are making decisions based on the way I look, the way I stand, my voice, my picture tone, lots of things. But hopefully, you wouldn't allow that to affect the way you think about me, would you? No, you're cognitive beings. You have a huge upper cortex, which is split into two halves. Oh, this is very sensitive. The left side, it's not really like this, but it'll do. The left side is all about imagination, creativity, and the future. And the right side, and the left side is all about logic and learning and the past. And when these two parts of our brain work together, we come up with brilliant decisions. We do the right thing. We eat healthily. We go to bed early. We sleep. We spend time with our families and do all the things that we know we should do. Agreed? Until the pressure comes in. And then we go back to our old patterns. Because under pressure, one side of our brain is dominant, but actually it's worse than that. Only small amounts of that upper part of your brain is dominant. Which side do you think is dominant for you? Your left side or your right side? When you're problem solving at work, are you imaginative, creative, future thinker, big picture, legacy, or are you logical, learning from the past and this is the goals and the objectives and the plan? Which do you think? Bad news? Imagine you're back at school. <coughs> I ask you a question, you're not allowed to answer, but you must put your hand up before you answer, okay? Because we'll have none of that nonsense. What's two plus two? Quickly. Yes. Incorrect. Next. Yes. No, you've got short term memory, you should listen to that. Okay, next. Now. Are we trying to be clever? I heard you made a comment earlier. And I, I, I've picked up on you. I've already worked you out. Yeah. See, we're trained to get it right, and you are looking for a reward. Two plus two equals four. Yes. And based on logic and learning in the past, it's correct. However, you didn't really ask any questions or ask what the paradigm was. Two plus two what? Two plus oranges. Two plus bananas. What was the what was the context of the two? That's just a unit of measurement. You're thinking I'm a freak. We know that the great genius, the great leaders, have the ability under pressure to use both their logic and their imagination. At the same time, the bad news is you are trained to use your logic, which sometimes the lessons of the past may not help you in the future. The other problem is that brain three works much more slowly than brain one and two. See, brain one and two keep you alive. If there was a lion or a tiger outside the doors now, would you want brain one or two working? Bit of adrenaline and we'd run away. Yeah? What happens if you use brain three? Hi folks, I'm actually from the health and safety department here. Um, I'm here to inform you of the presence of a wild animal on the, on the, in the building. We've uh, videoed it. It appears to have reticulated canine teeth, indicating it's carnivorous. Um, it also has, uh, its eyes are fixed, indicating low blood sugar levels. It's hypoglycemic, therefore it's a hungry carnivore. Um, with that calculated terminal velocity, we believe it to be great in the resistance created on the hinges on these doors, therefore uh, it could break them down. So on that risk assessment, we're in grave danger. But don't worry, we've got a plan. We've strategized. Okay, here's the strategy. We're going to identify the weakest member of this group and just throw them outside. It should be fine. Yeah? The strategies, the plans are great, but they never suffer the first contact with the enemy. Or, as a famous boxer once said, Mike Tyson, they've all got a plan and a strategy when they box me until I punch them in the face. <laughs> and then you need to change your plan. You need to be more creative, imaginative, and move. So, my suggestion is that the problem we have is we would love to use brain three. But sometimes, if brain two perceives something to be a threat, it activates brain one, the fight flight response, and brain three shuts down. This is what we react to. This is what we live with. The brain can't tell the difference, which is a real shame. So we still respond. 
Although we know we think we should do the right things, we sometimes don't. We know we should eat healthy, go to bed early, but when you're under pressure, it's really exciting. Agreed? It's fun. It gets stuff done, but it doesn't create a legacy. And this can happen to anybody at any time really quickly, and this is what I'll leave you with. Does anyone here have children under 14 years of age? Okay. Any boy children under 14 years of age? Okay. Anyone with children over 14 years of age? Okay, you'll understand this. You'll understand this. I have three boys who were under 14, and at one point I was a god. I could go on away on a cricket tour or a rugby tour, and I could return, and they'd say, Dad, how are things? I said, they're great. Until I returned after one tour, and I said, boys, how are you? Where have you been? Pardon? Where have you been? You just wander back into the house and think you can tell us what to do? I was just asking how you were. Yeah, what's my life, Dad? You lead your life, I'll lead yours, all right? Don't tidy your room immediately, you cheeky young man. No, Dad, I won't. In fact, Mum told me that you didn't tidy your room before you left. You left it in a bit of a mess. You're no role model, so when you start setting the standard, then I'll start doing the same. What do you do? Let's think about brain function. Well, I've been on a parenting course, and I'm told that what I should do is give my child space. I should uh, discuss it, I should take on the feedback, and I should consider what he's had to say. So exactly what I did, I took them out for a meal. I sat them down, 10, 12, 14, we ordered a meal. I was about to start my deep and meaningful level three conversation with my son as appropriately designed. As I was about to speak, from next door to me comes the following noise. <coughs> my level two says, as you do, that's not right. Yeah, that's not right. But using level three, I decided the best thing to do was not give him the oxygen of publicity. I ignored him. He took a drink. Oh my goodness me, my level two really does not like this. It's getting quite irritated and annoyed because my dad said you shouldn't behave like that. It's very wrong and very bad. Don't do it. I thought, what do I do when I'm running the elite coach program for the Olympic coaches? The way to change young people's behaviour under pressure is to ask them questions, raise their awareness and get them to take responsibility for their action. I turned to him, about to tell him this, his eyes fell. <laughs> My brain three now is going mad. Yeah. It's flushing with a lack of oxygen. Brain one and two are saying hit him, but with the little bit of brain three that's still alive, it asks him a question. I turned to him and I said, son, are you aware that when you behave in this manner, some people may perceive your behaviour to be inappropriate? As a result of that, they will discriminate against you because they will think you are poorly brought up and have poor values. As a result of that, you will be at your detriment and you may not get a job. Please, would you eat in the proper manner? As we've discussed, as my father taught me and as you've been taught, please would you not slurp your drink and please would you put your phone away and communicate with the family? Good. To which he responded, what is your problem, you dickhead? <laughs> as much as I know I shouldn't, I clenched my fist, my teeth gritted, my blood pressure up, my heart rate went up, and here's the problem. The blood, instead of going to brain three, went to brain two and brain one. Luckily, I didn't hit him, but I nearly did. I ran out into the car park, did four laps to try and calm down. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> if you're in the world where you are rewarded for being sharp and quick, then you need to think about how you can control brain three. And the messages that you're about to hear, I'm sure from my colleagues, are going to be, you have to cope with it, you have to look after your physiology, you have to exercise well, you have to slow down, you have to relax, you have to eat healthy. You also have to confront your dark side. See, we all say we're lovely, kind people, but actually, do you have a dark side? Do you have things that really annoy you and irritate you? Do you have a voice in the back of your head that says you're not good enough, you can't do it? Because if you do, unless you confront it, under pressure, you'll find it out in the last place you want to find it out, which is in a performance environment. And the final thing to do is learn something called mental athletics. Do something your brain's never done before. Do this, do some public speaking, go and take a course in acting, learn a poem, read some plays, do anything. Not whether you're good at it, just to develop your brain, to enable your brain to work through two and three, to come to terms with your emotional self and also to work on your upper cortex. Clive Woodward called it TCUP, Thinking Correctly Under Pressure. He stole it off someone called Yehudi Shinar, whose actual works was Correct Thinking Under Pressure. And he researched fighter pilots, Israeli fighter pilots. How do you identify a successful Israeli fighter pilot? They're still alive. And what he discovered was it wasn't their training, it wasn't their education, it was their ability under pressure to make the right decisions. My appeal to you 
and the bit you might not like is you know what to do eat less play more sleep better and relax but now under pressure you've got to access your brain through and do it that's the difficult bit I'm sure these three guys are going to inspire you to think how you might do it but for me and my time is up thank you very much well you didn't like me you did thank you